Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and welcome to another episode of Parallel C++. So in this episode of the series, we're going to be talking about the difference between lock-free and wait-free algorithms and operations. So in our previous video, we looked at the differences between our blocking and our non-blocking algorithms and operations. Now we can further classify our different um, non-blocking algorithms and operations by if they are lock-free or if they are also wait-free. But what exactly do these two categories mean? So at high level, um, for a non-blocking algorithm or operation to also be lock-free, right, what we're going to do is make the guarantee of system-wide progress. So at any given point in time, at least one thread is going to be comp successfully completing its work, right, useful work. Now we can still have other threads that can interfere with each other and force um, each other to, you know, retry doing their work, but at least one thread at any given point in time is making forward progress and pushing the system forward. Okay, so that's our lock-free implementations. Now on top of this, so on top of being non-blocking and lock-free, we can further make the guarantee of per-thread progress. And that's what we call our wait-free you know, algorithms and operations. So what we're going to be looking at today is a simple example of a lock-free implementation and a wait-free implementation for a simple operation that we looked at last time, right? We're just trying to increment some shared integer. So let's go ahead and look at these two examples and try to understand lock freedom and wait freedom a little bit more. So we'll go ahead and open up our first example, right? This is our lock free implementation. And it should look somewhat familiar. This is really just you know, pretty much the exact same example we looked at last time for non-blocking, right? So all of our lock free algorithms are also non-blocking. So here, you know, what exactly are we doing? So for our setup, we're just going to be doing two to, two to the 25 iterations, right? Doing these increments across eight different threads here. So we'll just evenly divide our work per thread. Then we have some atomic integer here called sync that we're going to be updating. And then we actually have our lambda that's going to be uh, the work done by each of our threads. So each thread is going to do this items per thread iteration. So one eighth of the total work. And for each iteration of this for loop, they're going to try and load the current value of sync into expected here. Then they're going to try and update that value here by first doing expected plus one and setting that desired equal to that value. So this is the new value that we want to publish. And then to publish that value, we try to do this uh, atomic compare and exchange with our uh, shared integer here, our shared atomic int sync. So if you know we find that you know our expected value that we loaded earlier is the same as sync currently, so no one has updated sync between when we loaded it and now when we're trying to store to it, we'll publish our updated value here of desired. If someone has come in between, right, our load and our uh, pair, uh, compare and exchange, we'll just reload sync into expected and go through this do while loop again. So what exactly makes this, uh, you know, non-blocking again? Well, if we paused or, you know, put one of these threads to sleep, that wouldn't block the work of our other threads. Our other threads would be able to successfully do their compare and exchanges still. Now, what exactly makes it also lock free? Now, at any given point in time, uh, one of our threads is successfully completing this compare and exchange, right? Now, why isn't this a wait-free um, algorithm or operation? Well, we still have the ability for, you know, threads to interfere with each other. So one thread can force another thread to sit within this do while loop. So for example, you know, thread one can do this load and then go into this loop and try to update desired to be expected plus one. But during this time, another thread can do its load, do its update of desired and do its compare and exchange, right? All three of these operations, right? While our thread one is still stuck here, right? Updating desired. So when, you know, thread one tries to do its compare and exchange, it finds it has that expected has already been updated. So sync is not equal to expected. So thread one is forced to do a retry here in this do while loop. So we can have unlucky threads in this lock free implementation, right? A thread can spend, you know, a ton of time or all its time just spinning in this do while loop, waiting to publish a single result and not actually making forward progress in all of its work here, right? And if we have more and more threads under more and more contention, this might be more likely to happen. Okay, so that's why it's not wait free. We don't have a guarantee of per thread progress. A thread can get unlucky and just spin, you know, basically forever in this do while loop. Okay, so uh, the rest of our code is pretty simple. We just spawn our threads to do this work. So spawn eight J threads. Okay, so that's our uh, block free implementation. Let's go ahead and take a look at our wait free implementation. And you know, perhaps this is not terribly surprising, 
Um, but you know, the kind of the logical conclusion of doing this, you know, update of some shared integer here across threads is just going to be doing an atomic increment. So we have the exact same setup. So two to the 25 iterations across eight threads, and we're going to split those iterations across those eight threads. Um, and then, you know, here's our atomic int that we're going to be updating. So why exactly is this very simple for loop with atomic increments, right? Why is this weight free? So let's kind of build up to that. So first of all, why is it non-blocking? Well, it's non-blocking because if we put you know, any one of our threads to sleep, it wouldn't block the execution of our other threads. Our other threads would certainly be able to just do their atomic increments. Okay, so that's why it's non-blocking. Now, why is it further lock-free? Well, it's lock-free because at any given time, one of our threads is doing this atomic increment. So at least one of our threads is making forward progress on its work. So that's why it's lock-free. Now, why is it also weight-free? Well, all of our threads can actually do this atomic increment. Now, this isn't to say that we still don't have, you know, processor cache effects and things like cache coherence. So this isn't to say that, you know, we don't have a cache line bouncing around between different cores and getting invalidated, um, you know, and things like that. We still have those architectural features that we have to, you know, think about from a performance perspective. But from an algorithmic perspective um, here, um, our threads can't interfere with each other and force, it to, force us to do, say, retries of this increment like they could with our lock for implementation. With our lock-free implementation, a, a thread could be forced to kind of stay in that do-while loop if it got unlucky. In this case, right, a thread can't stop us from doing an atomic increment. So each of our threads can make forward progress in their work. So that's why this is also a weight-free implementation. Okay, so the rest of our code is exactly identical um, to our uh, lock-free implementation for this weight-free one. Uh, we're just going to spawn, you know, eight J threads here and wait for them to complete in the destructor. Okay, so let's go ahead and quit out of here. And for fun, we can just compile these and run these. So we can go ahead and compile first our lock-free implementation, and then we can compile our wait-free implementation. And both of these are compiled with the exact same uh, compilation flags. So O3, C++20, and linking against libp thread for both lock-free and wait-free. So let's go ahead and just time these for fun and, and see what the performance difference is. So we'll first run our lock-free implementation. And what we see is that it takes, you know, somewhere on the order of, you know, 2.8, maybe we get a little bit luckier, you know, all the way down to two seconds, you know, and then somewhere usually in between that range. So between, you know, you know two seconds and three seconds seems to be about right. Um, maybe even getting even luckier and getting all the way down to, you know, 1.6, 1.7 seconds. Now let's go ahead and time our wait free implementation. And what we see is that it's a whole heck of a lot faster, right? So we're somewhere on the order of 0.6 and 0.5 or 0.55 seconds here. But let's try to think about this logically, right? With our wait-free implementation, really the only cost we're paying is for that increment in the cache line that's bouncing around, right? There's no real interference other than that going on between our threads. Now with our, um, our lock-free implementation, we can have contention between our threads and force our different threads to spin around in that do while loop, right? So that can, you know, lead to this extra, um, you know, execution time here because we have this contention and it can also lead to our variability inside of our execution time. So we can continuously have this problem, right? Where we have this contention between our threads, right? On top of, you know, our normal, uh, just, you know, cache line contention when doing an atomic increment here. We're doing more work. We're having to do it load and then also do this compare and exchange. But, right, we might get unlucky and someone else might have done a compare and exchange between when we did that load and our compare and exchange. Okay, so that's going to go ahead and do it for this time. I'd, of course, like to leave this with a few caveats. Um, Wait-free implementations are not strictly better than lock-free implementations, especially when it comes to performance. In fact, it could be incredibly difficult to even implement uh, certain algorithms in a wait-free manner. A lot of the algorithms that you'll see out there um, will be lock-free, right? Though there are some examples of wait-free uh, implementations of, you know, certain things like data structures out there. Um, you know, we, we also you know, don't always care, you know, strictly only about performance here. Sometimes we want a wait free implementation because of that guarantee of per thread progress, right? That's sometimes a very nice property that we would like to uh, maintain, even though, even if it's not quite as fast performance wise, right, as a lock free implementation. So there's lots of things to consider when choosing, you know, the type of algorithm to use. 
But that's going to go ahead and do it for this time. Uh, I'd, of course, encourage you to look more uh, at lock-free data structures, weight-free data structures, and lock-free and weight-free algorithms um, in your spare time. Um, but that's going to go ahead and do it for today. You can find this and any of my other examples at github.com slash coffee before arch. But that's going to go ahead and do it for today. As always, I'm Nick, and I hope you have a nice day.